Our subject of the morning is knowing the right persons. We are in a series and shall continue in it for a brief time on God's men face the crisis of their lives. Today, knowing the right persons. The sixth chapter of Isaiah, of which I read a portion this morning, is the continental divide in the life of Isaiah. It is the watershed of his life. I do not know what was on the other side, for this chapter marks the beginning of life for the prophet as far as we know him. This chapter has been called the call and commission of Isaiah, and certainly it is that, as well as I think even more than that. It came at a very dark moment in the history of the nation. It was the death of Isaiah, and that is the beginning of the chapter. And Isaiah begins immediately to take us to a funeral in the year that King Uzziah died. That's the way the chapter gets off. This man, Uzziah, had been the tenth king of Judah. He was made king at the murder of his father, Amaziah. At that time, he was only sixteen years of age. Uzziah reigned for fifty-two years. He changed his name to Azariah. He had a very strong defense department. In other words, this man introduced new methods of warfare, because during the reign of his father, the northern kingdom had come down and had taken Jerusalem and had destroyed a portion of the city. And now Uzziah fortifies the city again and introduces on the battlements and on the walls new types of slings and of arrow warfare. And because of this, he was able to defend himself, and not only defend himself, but to strengthen the nation again. He was victorious over the ancient enemies of the nation Israel. He got a victory over Edom, a victory over the Philistines. In fact, he destroyed several of the Philistine cities. And then he had a victory over the Arabs. This man was an outstanding man in many ways. He was a patron of agriculture. It was an era of plenty in the nation. It was a prosperity that has been likened to the times of King Solomon and the first that they had had since King Solomon's day. The only thing that marred his half-century reign was a national disaster. It was an earthquake that even was remembered as late as the days of Amos, because Amos uses it as a point of dating. It must have been something that was tragic indeed. But this man was able to overcome that national disaster. He was a nominal worshiper of Jehovah. He attended regularly the services of the temple. At least he went at the 11 o'clock service. You could always find him there then. But he was lifted up by pride, this man, coming to the throne as a teenager of 16, And as he grew in power and became successful, this man indeed became a very proud king, so much so that he intruded into the high priest's office. He took a censer of incense, and he attempted to go into the Holy of Holies. He didn't get quite that far. He only got to the holy place. The golden altar was as far as he came and he was smitten with leprosy, and he was a leper until the day of his death. Now, had you been in the kingdom of Judah during this half-century when he was in office and when he was the king, he was the right man to know in Jerusalem and Judah, especially if you wanted a defense contract or you wanted something from the government. 
And Isaiah was on the inside. It's believed that Isaiah was actually a member of the royal family. He doesn't sound like it in some of the things he says, but evidently he had entree to Uzziah. He apparently thought a great deal of him. Now Uzziah, the great king, he's dead. And there'll be no longer a political pull for Isaiah, at least he doesn't see it at this time. He'll be able and his friends will no longer be able to get to the public trough. And because of that, he feels that a great tragedy has taken place in the nation. In the year that King Uzziah died, the nation is now going to the Bow Wows. That is the story that has been, I suppose, repeated thousands of times. But actually, friends, this man, Isaiah, was not the right person to know. This man, Isaiah, thought so, and he had geared his life to this man, apparently, for a long time. He was a young man at the death of Isaiah, but this great prophet, was not a great prophet at this time because he was thinking no higher than Isaiah, and he had his life geared to the life of this man. So this man did something that I think was the proper thing to do at a time like this. At least it paid him rich dividends because now he's going to meet the right persons, if you please. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Now, shall we look at that for just a moment? Because this man, Isaiah, now for the first time meets the right person and he meets the real king of Judah, the one who was back of the throne, and he made a discovery that the real king of Judah was not dead, that the real king of Judah was not even sick, and that the real king of Judah had not even thought of abdicating from the throne at all, and though Isaiah was dead, God was still upon the throne. May I say that that was a very important and impressive truth for this man to learn. There are a lot of us Christians today that need to learn that also, that God is still upon the throne today, and that he moves back of the scenes whether he's recognized or not. And so this man made a twofold discovery concerning God. First of all, he found out that God was still upon the throne controlling the life of the nation, and that the thing that had happened was not contrary to the will of God, but was going and ultimately must fit into God's program. I saw this statement this week in preparing my lectures for Dallas. The children of Israel came up to Kadesh Barnea. They could not enter in because of unbelief. You would say that that upset God's plan. It did not. You can never, by what you do, alter God's plans. You may delay the fulfillment of them. And the children of Israel delayed the fulfillment of them forty years. But God said, even when they failed, he went immediately and said to Moses, Now when you come into the land, You can never alter or change God's plans. You may delay the fulfillment of those plans. But God is moving to the accomplishment of his purpose, and he's still on the throne today. My, how we need to recognize that in this hour, because, frankly, it looks to me like he has abdicated, And this world today seems to be out from and under his control altogether. But I say to you this morning that things are going toward his conclusion today. And his purpose is being fulfilled in the world even at this present hour. He said that it would come out like this. 
there would be the failure of man. And man is having his little day at the present hour. God has been ruled out. God has ruled out of politics today. Have you heard anyone of any party, any candidate, say anything about the fact that we need to turn to God today? And this is supposed to be a Christian nation, and those who came here came here in order that they might establish a nation in which we could worship God. And he's now ruled out. He wouldn't have a chance in Washington, D.C. today. And he wouldn't have a chance in Sacramento today. God has been ruled out of this nation today. You can delay him. My friend, you will not alter his plan and purpose. And he said it would come to a day like this. We need to get in step with God today. May I say this, that one of the persons that we need to know today is God. If you want to know some of the right persons today, the most important one to know today is God. The fact of the matter is, is to know Jesus Christ. That was his prayer. That was the last prayer, and it's the Lord's prayer that he gave. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. You want to know the right persons today? They're not in Washington. They are not in Sacramento. The right persons to know today happens to be God, my beloved, and to know his Son, Jesus Christ, as your Savior. That's the thing that's important in this hour in which we're living, is to know God and how this nation needs God. God doesn't need America, but America needs God in this hour in which we've come. And so this man made the discovery that God was still upon the throne. He entered the temple in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne. Now will you notice the second great truth that he learned concerning God. And that is a forgotten truth today also, and it is this. He's high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doa moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. We are told way back in the book of Numbers. And you'll pardon me for going back because that's where I've been reviewing this week. The first time it's mentioned, God said there again at Kadesh Barnea, you can't hinder my plan, you cannot hinder my purpose, the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God. That's God's purpose. And he intends to put men aside filled with pride like Isaiah. They're going to die, my friend. They're on the way out, every last one of them. Oh, they'll continue to come until Antichrist comes. But... They're on the way out because God has determined that this earth shall be filled with his glory. And Isaiah saw that in this vision given to him of God upon the throne. And so the second great truth concerning God is this, that he's not only on the throne, but he is a holy God. We're living in a day when there has been such a breakdown in morals that it has penetrated into the church today. There are those that believe that you can live on a low plane for God today. 
that somehow or another that God has come down to our level and he will go along with us. Now, he'll save you in your sin. He'll not leave you in your sin, nor will he walk with you in your sin. God is holy. He has never yet changed that one whit. He has not changed it today. He is a holy God. He is high. He's lifted up. And he's moving forward today undeviatingly, unhesitatingly, uncompromisingly against sin. He won't even accept the white flag of truce from sin because he doesn't intend to make peace with it. God does not intend to walk hand in hand with godless communism. God will not walk hand in hand with godless capitalism. God will not walk hand in hand with godless politicians. God is holy today. And he's moved out of the scene today because he says that he is so holy he cannot even look upon evil. And this notion today that you and I can come down to a low level and then keep mouthing about the fact we're having fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with him. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. A holy God today has made a way for sinners to come. And my friend, that's the only way they can come. You can't knock on the door of heaven today and say, here I am, I happen to be an American, I have my rights, and I'm a pretty nice guy. And I don't think that you could be at all just and fair and turn me down. That's the opinion of the average American today. Don't fool yourself. God is holy. And God has said, you're already a sinner. I've seen you that way. I've declared you that. And you can only come the way that I have made. There's none other name, Peter said to the Sanhedrin. There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. God has no two ways to be saved. He's narrowed it down to one way that will fulfill his holy character today because God has no notion of letting down the bars of heaven to let sinners in. He had to give his son to die. And I say that reverently. If God is to save sinners, Christ must die. Come down from the cross. He can't come down. If you and I are to go to heaven, he can't come down. He has to stay there. Oh, he can come down, but he'll go back alone. But we're told when he went back, he led captivity captive. And a great company are to follow him. And they're to follow him because there is one new and living way made into God's presence. That is a great truth concerning God. Do you know him today? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Do you know him today as the one who's on the throne? Do you know him today as the one who's the holy God, high and lifted up, and that you and I can only come to him today through Christ? Do you know him? He is the most important person to know today. Now, there's another person that you and I need to know. Will you notice this? When Isaiah was given this vision... I look around for him, and I can't find him. And the reason that I can't find him, he's down on his face before God. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. The second person that Isaiah met that's important to know 
is to know yourself. Yes, it is. It's very important for us to know ourselves. And candidly, there are very few of us that really know ourselves. We overestimate our ability, don't we? We overestimate many things, and many of us underestimate. Many of us have never yet made a true inventory of ourselves. We actually have been living with a person for years, and we still don't know him. Have you ever heard anyone say, I didn't think I would do a thing like that? Well, when we make a statement like that, and all of us have, it's because we just don't know the fellow that lives in this skin that we're occupying today. We're not acquainted with that at all. Socrates, the Greek, had as his motto, Genosko imu, know myself. That was the goal of his life. This great philosopher said the most important thing, and this is where he had to begin, this was the foundation, know myself. Very few of us know ourselves. I've been very much interested. I've been gathering together clippings now for several months, and I have several doctors who listen to me on the radio, and they always furnish me some very wonderful material. A doctor in the nearby town sent me the clipping out of the Medical World News back in July, and I never would have seen it, of course, if he hadn't sent it to me. Now, if there ever was a group of people who ought to know themselves, it's doctors, don't you think? They know how many bones are in the body, and they know all about the muscles, and they know all about the different workings of the organs of the body. Seems like if anybody knew themselves, it would be the doctors. But here was the title of the article, High Rate of Suicide Among Physicians. And in Great Britain, for example, the suicide rate among MDs is more than twice the rate in the rest of the male population. Now, you would think that a doctor would be one that would at least know himself. What about the psychiatrist and the psychologist? He not only should know the body, but he knows the mind. He should know all about himself. And then this same article, it says, among the specialties, psychiatry appears to yield a disproportionate number of suicides. Apparently, they just haven't got acquainted with themselves. What is the problem with most of us today? We don't know ourselves, and the thing that we don't know about ourselves is the fact of how bad we really are in God's sight. And that's not a popular thing to say to people today. And as a result, many ministers are saying some other things. They like to scratch people's back and tell what wonderful people they are. But my friend, may I say to you, I'm leaving for Dallas in the morning, so I can say this. You are sinners. Every one of you is a sinner, and you do not know how bad you really are. No, you don't. Every man knows that of himself which he dares not tell his dearest friend. Gertie the German said that. Samuel Johnson, the great literary light of the 17th century of Great Britain, said, Every man knows that of himself which he dares not tell his best friend, and then he added something to it. I see no crime committed but what I, too, might have committed it. Why didn't you? Well, God has put you in a different environment. You have a nature. Yes, you do. And God sees that nature. And as a proof of it this morning, every one of you has a guilt complex. All of us have. I have here the statement of Dr. James. He says, One single word which torments more Americans in more unsuspected ways than any other disease of the mind or body. What's the word? Guilt. Guilt. Why do you have that this morning? 
Because God has put it there, and it's one of the best governors you and I have ever had, is a guilt complex. Now, psychiatrists trying to get rid of it today so we can do as we please. God put it as a governor in our being to keep us from doing many things that we would do today. You've got a guilt complex. Listen again. I have the statement of Dr. Reed here. The mid-20th century has been characterized by a good many contemporary thinkers as the age of anxiety. It's a time when social and political problems, the outgrowth of our advances in technology, are coming upon us thick and fast, indeed so rapidly, that we have not had time to analyze them, let alone decide how they should be solved. Scientific advance, industrial and political concentration, coupled with social disintegration are all tending to develop what might well be called a worldwide neurosis, which manifests itself in a growing sense of insecurity at all levels of society, hence the age of anxiety. You and I are living in it today, uncertain, filled with fears this morning. Why? Because, my beloved, we don't know ourselves. Isaiah did not know himself, and he comes in God's presence, sees him high and lifted up, and he not only got a vision of God, he saw himself. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. Oh, how we need to see ourselves as we are. And when we do, my beloved, we can take that guilt complex that we've got this morning and bring it to the cross of Christ, and he, by his own blood, can rub out the guilt complex, and he's the only one today that can do it. You can lie on a psychiatrist's couch from now till doomsday, and you'll never get rid of it. You may shift it from one complex to another, but you'll never get rid of it. It's only when you bring it to Calvary and let Christ take your guilt and acknowledge it. I'm a man of unclean lips. I am guilty before God. And man, from the day of the Garden of Eden, when Adam fled from the presence of the Lord, men today are running from God. Why, they get interested in religion to get away from God. I'm convinced that this epidemic of joining churches after World War II was on the part of many people to get away from God. Yes, it was. Join a church and you can get as far from God as you possibly can. Oh, my friend today, just to know ourselves and to come to him and say, Oh, God, I am guilty. And when I come to the one today and the only one that can pardon iniquity, and he's high, and he's holy, and he's lifted up, and he said, I can cleanse you. Now will you notice this? And then we are through. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he'd taken with the tongs from off the altar. The altar is the brazen altar. I'm not talking this morning about seraphims. They apparently protect the throne of God. They have to do with the holiness of God. This seraphim went and got a live coal from off the altar, the brazen altar. That's where the sacrifices were offered. That altar speaks of the cross of Christ. He got a coal. A coal was the judgment. And he brought this thing to Isaiah and touched his lips. You want the New Testament application of this? Listen to Paul. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. He's talking now to believers. This man, Isaiah, had been to the brazen altar with the sacrifice that spoke of the death of an animal that looked to Christ as the Savior of the world. He was a saved man. 
but he's guilty when he sees himself in the presence of a holy God and he knows God now and he knows himself and he sees that there is a wide gulf fixed. And how can it be bridged? He can't bridge it. He knows he cannot bridge it. Therefore, the seraphim takes the coal from off the altar and he brings it and touches his lips. We would judge ourselves. We would not be judged. He's talking now to a believer, a believer that has been living like everybody else. Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. I'm just like the rest of the crowd. I'm no different. But I'm guilty before God. And now the coal is brought, it touches his lips. And for you and me today, it's if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We've come through a missionary conference. Many people never heard the voice of God at all. Many Christians. We're not changed. We're apt to go back, as we did the other night, to evaluate the missionary conference, and we attempted to pick out its weaknesses. It had weaknesses. We all do. All of our program does. But that really is not the problem. My friend, when Isaiah had his lips cleansed, when he, a sinner, got right with a holy God, then something happened. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He never heard that before. Had God been calling before? Of course he had. Why hadn't he heard it? Because he happens to be a man of unclean lips, and he's done nothing about it. Then said I, here am I, send me. He'd never said that either, because he'd never heard. And the reason he hadn't volunteered to do something is simply because he would not see himself as he really was in God's presence, and that God could even use him. He says, now here am I, send me. The very interesting thing is, no man, no child of God can ever say, I'm to do nothing. I'm not in this business of making Christ known in any way. Listen. And he said, go and tell. Somebody says to me today, well, I just don't feel like there's anything for me to do. My friend, let's back up. Let's go to the sowers. It's not that there's not a need today and something needs to be done. It's not that God would not use you because he would. But we do have to go back. We need to know him. And we need to know ourselves. And when we know him as a savior who's high and holy will not compromise with sin. But when you and I see ourselves as we really are as sinners and we'll deal with it, he'll cleanse us. Blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keeps on cleansing us from all sin. Now he said, do something. Go and tell. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? As we come this morning to the communion table, it speaks of the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. It speaks of that which cleanses. But as we come, do we we see him today as a holy God? Or is this a commonplace thing that we just think we can come here on our own terms? There's no blessing here 
until you and I see him high and holy lifted up. And then we see ourselves as we really are. A dear lady said to me here several years ago, she said, I do not feel worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. I said, fine, then you are the one that ought to partake of it because there are too many people who think they are. Nobody's worthy. But he invites you to come, everyone to come. But he'd like for you to see him, that he's holy. He'd like for you to see yourself, that you're a setter. And I'm wondering this morning, if you were here, you've never really come to that altar that speaks of his cross. You've never really trusted him as your Savior. He's holy. He will not, he will not come down one iota. But Christ died to make it possible for you, if you're willing, if you're willing to acknowledge you're a sinner in his sight, he'll save you. Briefly now, before we pray, I'd like to ask this question. I must take just a moment for it, though. Are you present here this morning, willing to see him as a holy God, yourself as a sinner, but willing to come his way and accept Christ today as your Savior? Are you here today?